portion of our talk, Threats of America. Ellen, take it away and kind of give us a, a quick introduction about uh, inside outside strategy, maybe go over a little bit, but not as much as you did uh, uh, yesterday. And then uh, let's talk a little bit about our liaison project or in practical terms, what does inside outside strategy mean in terms of organizing and uh, in the Democratic Party and outside? Go ahead, Ellen. Sure. Um, again, and uh, I've seen you, Nurse Judy's here, and uh, obviously it's very early in the morning where I am, and uh, it's great to be with you. I'm a little first cup of coffee, you know. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, first of all, thoughts for everybody who's in the Northeast because of, I heard the weather's very rough up there. Not the case out here in California, but uh, we're making it up for it, but be, being up early. Um, inside outside strategy, and obviously I think Alex is going to disagree with this, but I think. You know, as the organizers of the session, if you if you just let us go with this for a little bit, uh, it, you know, obviously PDA was founded in 2004 because uh, they, we operate inside a two party system, and the left had seeded activity pretty much inside of electoral politics, and neoliberalism was rampant. Uh, wealth inequality was growing. Unions were getting weaker. Um, you had uh, massive uh, incarceration. Uh, unprecedented incarceration of the population. Um, and, you know, if you look at what was happening in politics as of 2004 um, and who was occupying the power within the Democratic Party, even compared to what was going on 30 years earlier with the weakening of organized labor, you had uh, people who were, uh, you know, incredibly close to the financial industry, which was becoming the central sort of organizing industry of American, the American economy. Um, you certainly had the NASDAQ market boom in the 90s. You had, by the late Clinton years, a real ascendancy of, of finance capitalism. You had the globalization trade pacts that were being negotiated that further weakened unions and um, really strengthened the hand of, of business and capital, and particularly, again, finance capital. Um, and so PDA was founded, uh, you know, and I think it's conspicuous, you know, four years after the Nader effort uh, to try to uh, have an impact in the electoral realm through a third party strategy. And that was uh, pretty much some dead in the water by 2004. And I don't know how many of the people who worked on the Kucinich campaign and PDA were enthusiasts of Ralph Nader's campaign in 2000. I certainly was in the middle of 2000. Um, and I get a lot of reasons to be very frustrated with how Al Gore ran the election. A lot of reasons to be frustrated by, with Al Gore. I mean, Al Gore, we are all happy about his interventions on uh, the global climate crisis, but he was a neoliberal bar none. Uh, even his responses to the climate crisis really are so saturated and fully integrated into a business will save us type of uh, you know thinking. So getting involved in... Um, um, <laughs> um, Getting involved with uh, with the inside outside strategy was 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 because the sense that you know just seeding the political realm, the legislative realm, the public policy realm to neoliberals was a disaster for society. It was disaster for the working class. Was disaster for the peace movement. Um, the capitulation of the Democrats to the Iraq War was pathetic. Um, so it was organized, uh, and the strategy always had been and has been that uh, again, short of the ascendance of a powerful third party or independent party strategy on, in national politics to move into one of the two parties that it is conceivable to move inside of it to organize pro-working class, pro-labor union, anti-racist, pro-environment, uh, anti-war policies, uh, and to do so as aggressively as possible. While, uh, of course, in 2004, you had strong movements on all of those fronts. Um, and to coordinate the work with those movements to bring the voices of the party. That's the theory of the inside-outside strategy. And I would just say further that, look, the, the goal of Progressive Democrats of America at the end of the day ultimately is to, and we're very involved as an organization, doing the very unpleasant, difficult organizing work of trying to transform the Democratic Party from the inside, even in terms of rules, uh, you saw a lot of fights following the Bernie Sanders campaign. PDA was central to that. PDA was the organization in 2016 that had the largest number of uh, Bernie delegates among any independent organization. 
Uh, we're on the steering committee of what's called the uh, Bernie, uh, Bernie Delegates Network, along with now Our Revolution, which is a partner of ours, and Roots Action, and, and then a, a, a few other people uh, who are just on the steering committee, but with now direct institutional affiliation, including Roseanne DeMauro, who you see ahead of them, versus Jim Pogby. Um, and uh, and again, uh, we're involved with the progressive caucuses of the Democratic Party, and we we maintain and our members just you know tend to maintain. So it's an organic relationship uh, of very being very active in the local movements and national movements for all the issues that that I mentioned earlier. And obviously, we're still this is a, a conference organized by Massachusetts Peace Action, and uh, we're very involved. Uh, you know, right up to meetings I'll be in later today, opposing uh, Michelle Flournoy as a prospective defense uh, department pick. Um, again, might be a quixotic effort, but we're we're pushing it hard because there simply are things that we think are intolerable, and they're intolerable about the appointments even in the Biden administration. I mean, Biden is going to have a honeymoon. He's following Donald Trump, um, and there's a lot that Joe Biden's going to do on three planes, I think right off the bat that we are going to applaud. First of all, um, the return to a, a belief in, you know, what would roughly be called a factual based reality, as opposed to Trump, uh, the uh, rejection of consistent race baiting that Donald Trump was always involved in. Um, the, on those fronts, the idiocies of Trump, et cetera, it'll be good to have somebody who doesn't buy into that. Then clearly on the pandemic front, uh, we see how Trump has been beyond a, he's been a murderous disaster because of his rejection of science. And then I think on the third front, I think there will be positive movement from the Biden administration right off the bat on one and or two planes. The first is there'll be a stimulus, especially if the Georgia seats are won by the Democrats. We can see the difference between the stimulus proposals from the Democrats and the Republicans. There'll be no excuse not to pursue an aggressive stimulus. And maybe they'll even essentially be forced into presenting a positive, um, meaningful stimulus. And we'll push. We'll push from the inside. We'll push from the outside to try to get as large a stimulus as possible at the federal level, which is necessary. Obviously, the capacity of the federal government to produce a stimulus is, um, I mean, in a sense, infinitely greater than what can happen at the local level. We have basically bankrupted state and local governments. We need uh, you know, not to, not to get into things like modern monetary theory, but um, the capacity of the federal government to run deficits and to send money out is essential right now. Uh, and it's really needed. So we'll and the other point, I think, um, you know, given, the, given the balance of the of way the Congress is, uh, and to be realistic, we will, of course, push for everything we believe in, uh, pressure uh, elected officials in the Democratic Party to adopt everything we believe in. But again, uh, I think where we'll see movement on stimulus past just a pandemic stimulus is going to be on infrastructure because the balance of the two parties is so close in both houses of Congress. Um, I do think the, the one thing that the Republicans are even back into forcing to accept is the idea of spending on stimulus. So on that pragmatic level, we'll push as much as possible, but never without insisting upon and demanding of all Democratic elected officials that they support the progressive agenda. We fully believe that the progressive agenda is the majority agenda of the base voters in the Democratic Party. We even saw this coming out of exit polls in states that Joe Biden won overwhelmingly were Bernie Sanders' positions when it came down to finally two candidates. And that, of course, was a very muddled period. Historically, the pandemic was overwhelming the Democratic primary in terms of news coverage and social concern. Uh, I think that did, I, when, you know, I think at the end of the day when the history is written of the second Bernie Sanders run, um, you know, he actually came closer to winning the second time than the first time. Uh, he was ahead in a way that he never was in 2016. But because of the way 2016 played out, uh, just in terms of the person of Bernie Sanders, uh, he was uh, probably, obviously, much more as a national political figure coming out of the 2016 election. Uh, but now in 2020, we have a situation where we have the squad who are members of the Democratic Party. Uh, they set an agenda inside Congress, and so does Pramila Jayapal, that we are broadly supportive of. Um, and then there's Bernie. Uh, there's Bernie. There's also other uh, progressive champions, and you know, obviously notably uh, Elizabeth Warren. Uh, her policies are, are good. Um, I saw Alex's last chat, and uh, you know, don't want to get into that again, but uh, you know, 
for what it's worth, Warren, outside of third party candidates and all the way since, uh, well, Kucinich had a great platform, but of a competitive, thank you, I appreciate that, Alex, yeah. But uh, but on paper, at least, the um, the uh, campaign platform was very, very, very progressive, and it chose the Democratic Party. Uh, you know, even half of it in a competitive uh, primary was supportive of very progressive policy positions, even with all the arguments that are made. So, Alan, you mentioned uh, progressive caucuses. Uh, can you tell us, with the... With the Bernie, uh, the phenomena, uh, Bernie Sanders and the movement, you know, the progressive movement growing uh, because of that, the paradigm that he has uh, uh, established in the poll that we have put out there. The work that in progressive caucuses, say, for example, in California, which you're familiar with, or Arizona oh. and other other states, how, how has that changed the dynamic in the Democratic parties of those states? Well, what that has done, that kind of work, and we do encourage members, uh, it's no obligation because it's very difficult work. And it's uh, you're going to face a lot of defeats and you're going to learn what the Democratic Party, the part of the Democratic Party that Alex has pointed out and pointed out in his Bali right before this started. Look, that's not unreal. I live in California. If you go to the California Democratic Party convention and you walk into wherever it's being held, you're going to see Wells Fargo, you're going to see other banks, you're going to see oil companies, you're going to see their banners, and because that's where the funders are listed. If you go to the places where the funders, the major funders are listed. And so we can't have any illusions about what we're up against in the National Democratic Party and in state parties, especially state parties where the state is so wealthy as, as California is. Um, and in California, where the Progressive Caucus is big, it's powerful. Um, and PDA was instrumental in its establishment uh, in, you know, at about the period about 13 to nine years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they have to pay attention to what we say. We've run two, people may not know if they're in California, but very competitive races to be the head of the Democratic Party. A woman named Kimberly Ellis was... Uh, and, the, and it's funny because you go down ballot from Kimberly and the two people she ran against and the other candidates also were on the left of the party. But, you know, not unlike what happened with Hillary Clinton getting the nomination and, and, uh, and Joe Biden getting the nomination, this sort of establishment Democrat one. Now the head, uh, it gets even more complicated because the head of the Democratic Party in California comes out of the LA County Federation of Labor. His name is Rusty Hicks. But... He's pretty much carrying water for a status quo Democratic Party. And again, we, that's the thing about playing inside the Democratic Party. It's frustrating. Yeah, the, in, in, in many ways. And in ways similar to the frustrations of 2016, what you're going to encounter are a situation where the sort of cards are, are stacked. But that's also stacked because of incumbency. And, uh, and, you know, there are real advantages within our electoral system if you're an incumbent. Uh, because again of the money system, also name recognition, et cetera. But the re-election of incumbents is really high and um, it's very hard to challenge um, and defeat incumbents. But we're building up the apparatus of that where PDA is, this isn't an advertisement for PDA, but it's my experience. We're, we're directly involved in always trying to set up um, coordination with other organizations from the Justice Democrats to Center for Popular Democracy, People's Action, Our Revolution, PSA, um, then PCCC. And we try to unify to have uh, one progressive running if they're challenging a moderate blue dog, neoliberal Democratic incumbent. This last time that wasn't really done as well as it needed to be done. And we had situations, for instance, very famously and very unfortunately, I believe Massachusetts Fourth District where you had the election of a former Republican, a very, very right-wing Democrat, and the progressives split the vote. And uh, so that's at least one where we're gonna have to try to get on the same page and challenge that Democrat. And there are a lot of places around the country where we have uh, constituents who are very progressive and they have very conservative Democrats. They don't even sometimes know. And this goes to a point that one of the people was saying right before the breakout sessions were attempted yesterday in the general sessions, about how disengaged the public are from their elected representatives and therefore how disengaged they are. I mean, any, any given congressional bill that changes law and impacts the lives, sometimes of all Americans, sometimes in very direct ways, sometimes in ways that are the difference between keeping your head above water or losing your house, um, certainly between 
you know, keeping a balanced household budget and going into debt. Uh, all sorts of issues around debt servicing, but it's so many issues. I'm just talking domestic economic issues. And any high school basketball game around the country gets more coverage. <laughs> and certainly any college football game gets loads more coverage than the legislation does. And, and they, you know, innumerable more people are involved with it. So PDA exists to change that balance. The inside out strategy exists to change that balance. We're interested in growing the inside outside practice that we are honing in on, uh, and we we are where we are welcoming in anybody from any organization. And our information that we'll collect from our liaison program will be available to the public. It will be available to our partner organizations. Um, we do have a very good name to try to achieve this. It's a better name. To, sorry if anybody's from our revolution or DSA, for instance. Um, we're, we have a better name to knock on the door of congressional representatives say we're progressive Democrats of America. If you are a revolution, they're going to know you're completely, you know, from the Bernie wing of the party and it's going to be probably harder to get a meeting. Uh, Democratic Socialists of America, they're probably just going to be shut out by most Democrat, Democratic offices, except for the, the ones that are already, you know, on our team, so to speak. So we have a good name for it. Um, and then as for indivisible, you know, they simply are, I mean, and no offense to anybody who's indivisible and involved with it. I know that it is a, um, uh, many chapters are very progressive and progressive leaning, but they're really a blue, no matter who electoral outlet. And, um, and that's really problematic. So God bless the progressives inside indivisible, their national office is quite progressive, but, um, yeah, as an organization, um, yeah, they, they really are made up of a lot of rank and file people who are happy as long as the person's not a Republican. And that's not what we're about. And that's not what the inside outside progressive strategy is about. It's about advancing policy that reshapes the economy, reshapes the foreign policy logic, reshapes our relationship to the environment and directly addresses and attacks American structural racism. Alan, um, uh, yeah. Alan one, one more question. And then I think uh, people are really interested in asking questions to you. And I think we can open it up and get uh, more, and more into the weeds. The last question I have for you then is, is uh, rolling out this liaison project, which you talked about a little bit about yesterday. Could you kind of go into what that, some of the details of what that means and the importance of it? Yeah, it's, um, look, it's something we're launching. It, we've for years done something called Educate Congress, where we have uh, monthly letters that are dropped off. Right now, of course, they're faxed in is probably up on Capitol Hill and in congressional offices, they still use faxes or we email them in. And, um, and then we follow up to make sure the letter. More traditionally before the pandemic, of course, we were delivered these in person, sometimes with a team of PDAers to local congressional offices. And again, um, Jim McGovern, Massachusetts Congress person, member of the Progressive Caucus, you know, really, really actually solid economic progressive um, and across the board, great voting record. He, when I met with him first, when I was ED, he said the most powerful thing you can do because people are so disengaged from pressuring their representative, that aspect of the way, according to civics class, this system is supposed to work is collapsed and they want it to have collapsed. They basically want unaccountable, accountable to the donors, um, accountable to the people who hold power in the logic of neoliberalism, that's not the citizenry. That's not the average household. That's certainly not the working class. Um, and so we, we want to rectify that. And the most powerful thing uh, Representative McGovern said is for actual constituencies, constituents, people who live in the district to visit and petition their Congress people. Now we're going to do this in a coordinated way, asking people to visit once a month ask for meetings with um, the legislative representative or whoever the head of the local office is uh, relevant to the issue that is being addressed. Um, so we wanna get relationships with the local staff and we wanna ask for quarterly meetings with the representatives. Um, that may be hard um, to get every quarter. We pretty much wanna time them around the time when, they, when their Congress is out of session, which by the way, of course, is been very difficult to figure out during the pandemic, but it'll go back to a normal schedule when the pandemic ends, um, which hopefully will be, according to the science, they're saying they have a good shot of getting herd immunity through the vaccines in May. But until then, we'll be doing it electronically and we'll be asking for Zoom meetings with, again, the local chiefs of staff. Um, and, uh, and then to go into, again, in-person with the power of in-person um, 
constituent lobbying, lobbying for bills, really existing bills that are seeking co-sponsorship and support that are drafted by the progressives in Congress and that are progressive measures. You know, the progressive caucus right now in Congress, which we work with directly, and we work directly with something called the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center, which this project is going to be in coordination with. We are maintaining our independence, though. We're not going to have them dictate exactly what bill we're going to do when we're going to do it, because we're going to be an inside-outside strategy, even in this. There are going to be movements that are going to want their particular um, uh, issues to be pushed forward. Um, but the CPCC is now much stronger than it's ever been. It did exist since the founding of the Progressive Caucus about 20 years ago now. Bernie Sanders, by the way, when he was in the House, was one of the founding members of the Progressive Caucus. That's how new it is. It's grown to almost 100 members. But to give you an idea of how weak as progressive some of the members can be, um, Lacey Clay was a member, the person that Cori Bush ran against. Um, and you had about 40 members in the last Congress who, you'd be surprised, are progressives in, in the current connotation of the word, which by the way, when people ask me what progressive means, as you can imagine I get asked that and uh, have to counter near a tandem and her claim for what it means um, is, uh, you know, it basically is the word that's used to, to speak about the left wing of American electoral politics, that simple. So who, who is in the progressive caucus? Right now, uh, there's a real effort by Pramila Jayapal to turn that in to a more classically operating legislative caucus, uh, which really is uh, gonna be set up. And I think this is what her aim is. And as you can imagine, Pelosi and the leadership want none of it, uh, to vote as a block. And, um, and of course, with this razor thin um, majority that the Democrats are gonna have, it doesn't even take the progressive caucus, it should taste the squad and squad 2.0, which is certainly gonna have at least six people in it, enough to, well, I suppose they'd have to actually vote against the bill. If they vote against the bill and they vote with the Republicans, they will defeat bills because it's a five seat majority right now in the House. It might go up to seven, but it's five right now. At any rate, with Ro Khanna and a few other people, Pramila, et cetera, they, they would get up past that level. So how that's gonna play out, whether on certain bills, Pelosi will just shrug them off and go over to McCarthy is what we're gonna have to see and look out for. So that's the terrain of Congress. Now on the liaison program, I'll say this and Dan's gonna hate me for it, but if the Democrats do win Congress, uh, do win the Senate, we will have, we will scramble and through the state coordinators, hi Russell, we'll, uh, <laughs> we're gonna try to set up liaisons for the 50 senators as well. So it'll go from, and two liaisons per office. I um, mean, obviously we, we go if we have one per office. Uh, so at the, at the minimum that would be 272 liaisons, double that is what we aim for when we fill the program out. Alex asked a question about diversity in PDA. We don't actually, we've never added up those statistics since I've been ED, but the idea of the liaison program is that the liaisons will be reflective of the demographics of the district. Um, right. So at least on the signature program will be reflective of the, um, not just of the elected officials, but of the demographics of the district. And there certainly are large uh, communities uh, that are very underrepresented in certain districts. So we're going to try to not be reflective of the caucus, the Democratic caucus, but of, and then, by the way, in the Senate, it's outrageous, of course. It's just right. bad. Uh, Minsky, thank outrageous. you very much. Does that mean I have to work with Kirsten Sinema? Darn. How about Shea? Yeah. Look, Kirsten Sinema was an anti globalization demonstrator 20 years ago. So, not surprisingly, she was once on the board of. Progressive Democrats of America, Arizona, but that her politics are very different than what they are now, and they're really pretty horrendous. Right. And so in many uh, respects, in okay many respects, me. worse than uh, than mansions because the dynamic in Arizona is 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 promising, getting more promising politically. So it's really shameful, and I actually I would not be surprised in a few years if she's uh, if she continues on her trajectory. I wouldn't be surprised if she ends up in the Republican Party. So if it's okay with you, Alan, is it okay now uh, that we open it up and get mm -hmm. some? At questions. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, Mike Hirsch, thank you for helping the uh, board there. Is the best way to facilitate this, uh, people raise their hands is, and we go one at a time? Okay, can you help me with that? Oh, you can't? Okay. So, if people have questions with for uh, Alan, either on uh, inside outside strategy generally or particularly, or about the liaison uh, project. 
with the, our local uh, uh, con Congress members. Uh, now is the time. Let's take a stack of the first two or three people. Hmm. Okay, I see. Looks like organizer PSU is first one up. Yeah, where's where's PSU? What does that refer to? Or what is it? You have I to apologize. My my uh, my uh, renaming today. Uh, that's my day job. It's a profession. It's a public sector union in the Mass Teachers National Ed Association mm -hmm. at UMass Boston. But my other job, my work beyond my job, is that I'm a member of Liberation Road, which is a longtime socialist right. organization. And you had some speakers yesterday affiliated with this. But mm -hmm. the question I wanted to ask is. Are you in contact with folks who are doing um, the inside outside work through organizing upgrade, like including the front line and a number of other left groups? Because we're trying to flesh out, and also the state power caucus, because we're trying to flesh out, in addition to the inside outside dem work, which we've worked really hard and it hasn't been an easy lift get right. people to engage with the Dems. We've been trying to talk about the need to build long-term multiracial working class base, uh, which is often, frankly, in Massachusetts, a little different than the base that progressive Dems are, you know, are building. So, and build institutional power that way. So I wanted to see if you're in touch with that and what you're thinking about the I would think happy effort to flesh out multiple dimensions to inside outside. Oh, I'm very happy for that. And yeah, we are in touch with the front line and other, the whole, the whole, um, there's a, just this, you know, PDA was sort of out a little earlier than the, in the era of the rise of organizations, at least, you know, hope yeah, to yeah, yeah. influence the democratic party. They're now out a range of them and we're, we're in touch with them. Uh, the groups that really um, try to convene, and we, we were central to, for instance, we were central to the People Power for Bernie group. Uh, we were central to Trump, United Against Trump. And I think it was PDA, People's Action, CPD. Um, those guys took the convening role, but I ended up really working with, with um, people from those two organizations to continue to convene those. We'll also convene the winning primaries. And, and newer formations that rise up, they're all invited. I mean, you know, coordination is really central. And uh, yeah, PDA definitely in some parts of the country has a much older uh, membership. This goes back a little bit to the founding, um, you know, and also PDA, you know, not to talk inside baseball too much, but we had a really charismatic founding executive director who died way before his time. And, uh, and I think the organization somewhat stalled um, at a very, <laughs> The very moment that we called upon Bernie Sanders to run for president as a Democrat, him died. Uh, and, you know, Bernie came to his memorial and uh, PDA was still the only organization in the country pressuring him to run. And that was a very important event, Tim's memorial for launching the Sanders campaign in 2016. But, um, you know, I, I don't mean to cast dispersions on the veteran, you know, suit in PDA, but... Um, and there's no dispersions to cast. It's just very difficult when you lose a leader like that. Um, and uh, and so, you know, who knows if our revolution would have been formed if Tim hadn't died? It was, and they're now full partners with us. I mean, we're uh, we have an official partnership, and um, I'm on again. I'm on calls with our revolution every week, and we play different roles. We have a different division of labor, and that goes a little bit towards the naming too. I mean, it's sort of a silly thing to, to focus on the name, but there are things that can be done with a name. And, and also, by the way, we're very happy to partner with, um, you know, I don't know what to call them, but uh, anti-capitalist organizations, uh, democratic socialist organizations, um, and certainly, you know, building, uh, you know, we, we do see trying to attain social democracy in the United States as, as the goal that we immediately seek. Um, and, you know, I think Bernie Sanders, and one of the things too, Sanders was, was hit a lot in 2016 at the beginning of the campaign for talking about the Scandinavian countries. And you know, if people remember when it was sort of early 2015, he talked about, and Naomi Klein will say this, like you look at the organization of industrial technological societies and you don't really have to go very far to find the template that works best. And, you know, on all the indices that the organizations like the United Nations keep track of, 
that are going to rank the highest. And, you know, all, it is always the same countries, and um, they have very low Gini coefficients in terms of wealth distribution, great public health, great public education. Um, the fact that they're predominantly white organizations is a product of, you know, Eurocentric post-colonial history and imperialism and racism, but it doesn't mean that the template can't be applied to the diverse countries, and the United States uh, is becoming the most diverse country in the history of the world. Uh, it's the born of a really horrible history. Um, and uh, and to, to work towards that kind of, I think for another thing too, if you pursue that model, I think it breaks the logic of neoliberalism. I think you just simply are gonna go into another historical phase if you uh, start to demand the redistribution of wealth, uh, not the service of all public policy uh, really in the service of the investor class, which is what I think neoliberalism, that's the sort of central organizing tenet of neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. Sorry, interrupt you. I think we have another question from, is it X, X? Yeah, I can X ramble on my first cup of coffee. So Enid, you're up. Yeah, uh, thank you. Just cut him off, you guys. No, go ahead. Um, so when I thought inside, outside, I was thinking, um, like I'm active in Massachusetts. I actually am active in uh, you know, Progressive Mass Raise Up, which is our big statewide coalition around um, mm. working class issues, you know, was active in Bernie's campaign. But when I think inside outside, what I'm really thinking about is how do we mobilize the thousands and millions of people who um, really can make a difference? Because for example, I worked really hard. I was with SCIU for like 30 years. And in 2007, we really put everything into the Obama campaign. And we told our members who were cynical that if we elect a Obama, we will maintain organization, be on the streets to win something in the first hundred days. And for a lot of reasons, which are not really important, SEIU did not do that. And I think we totally blew it and we let the right wing take over. I remember going to the um, town hall meetings about health care in Massachusetts in our blue state and being horrified that the right wing controlled the agenda and we lost that fight. Like, you know, when I think inside, outside, I think inside is what you're describing and the rings around it. But I'm concerned about how do we bring the other 90% uh, of people who voted for Biden, who you know may have some progressive ideas, not have progressive ideas, but you know how do we move people, you know, on the streets, in their cities, to do what we really need to do, which is to reclaim politics and. I'm all always interested in what happens in DC, but I am a Massachusetts activist. And I guess I'm just putting that question out when we think about inside out, that to me, outside is really about mobilization of the masses, such as we saw this summer around Black Lives Matter, such as we saw last September in the climate strikes, if I can think back that far. And how do we, how do we build those two links simultaneously? So I'm just throwing that question out because to me, that's about the outside strategy. Yeah, no, the, the thing about, okay, one thing is you can't, you're right. There, it, it is sort of a double-edged I, I guess I'm just, I, can I just say one more thing? I feel like this was supposed to be a workshop, and I'm not being rude here, but I feel like it's good to hear oh. other people here, so. Oh, yeah, no, sorry. No, sorry, I, I, I think, yeah, I think maybe we, I misunderstood I, that. Maybe I yeah, misunderstood no, Yeah, so. I think the organizers sort of framed it a little differently for us, but um, okay, you know, I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm willing to open this up. I'll just say this one thing, which is that I do think, you know, it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, the movements have been more powerful than um, the force of progressive politics inside the electoral realm. Um, and, and of course, and, but you know, if there's a shift to where there's a balanced focus and there's energy inside the electoral realm, look, there are also ways that electoral politics suffocate movement activism. So your point is really well taken. And of course, both have to be made uh, and lifted up and strengthened across the board. I'm really, really, I, I obviously talked more at this conference than I ever thought I would because of what happened after the breakout sessions failed last time. If Dan's okay with it, I think we should just go to an open conversation. Yeah, I'm I'm all for that, and I thought we could facilitate it through questions. But if there's a way of doing it, where we're not speaking over each other, and we're actually, uh, you know, uh, respecting each other, that would be great. Um, I think we have Alex and then Pocky. Uh, Alex and Pocky, okay. Yes. So um, I think inside out strategy. I think about. Uh, Malcolm X and, and Martin Luther King. That's that's what I think about. That's the first thing that comes to mind. And when I see a lot of different, you know, crumbs being given to the progressive movement in Massachusetts, um, you know, we, we all know it's like, oh, you'll get one one bill here um, and and then wait, wait for all the rest of it. Um, it's it, for me, it's really about 
demanding. Um, you used words like realistic, uh, uh, you know, and, and what, what is elect electorally possible. Um, and again, it's just like, what's realistic, you know, whatever. The reality is we still live in, in, a, in a seriously racist society, you know, that these are the facts of the matter. So we shouldn't be dealing with what's realistic. What's realistic has been a bunch of bullshit, like period, period. So again, we need to change what's possible. And I know Bernie changed what, what people think is possible in the minds of a lot of Americans. When I think outside strategy, I think sit-ins. Like I think about my time at Standing Rock. I think about my time organizing against the pipelines here in the biggest, in the biggest civil disobedience in all of the United States in West Roxbury based on amount of arrests. Like that's what I think about. And we need to talk about that because that's the only thing that is gonna move this bar forward. We cannot, we cannot keep calling this stuff something that it isn't. We need to lock the doors, especially one, and I'll stop after this, but the head of the Mass Dems working with Congressman Neal to smear the young gay challenger, Alex Morse, is a bunch of fucking bullshit. And they should have their doors locked we know that that's against the rules. So I've been on the board of the Young Dems of Massachusetts. We all know the fucking rules. Like shit like that cannot happen. Can't happen at all. It needs to be shut down. So again, my call would be for more organizations to lock the doors and say, no, you don't need to go to work today. You, you're not following your own rules. So that's the type of energy and time that I'm on because this other stuff, I'm sorry to say, has not has not happened. Like we can talk about Raise Up and Lou Finfer, and I love I love him, but yo, we need to be locking doors to get what we want. Period. This crumb stuff is not it. So that's that's what that's what I'm talking about. Thank you, Alex. Uh Alan, do you want to respond to that? And then we'll go to Paki. No, no, let's just keep talking. But I do think if Jenna and, uh, and and Diane can be patient, I think Paki just was having trouble raising her hand and wanted to speak and raise her hand physically. So Paki, it's up next. Yeah, so thanks. And thanks, uh, both of you, all of you. Uh, I, uh, I, I live in the free state of the Western Massachusetts, the Pioneer Valley. Um, and uh, so, so I, I sort of sometimes am seduced into thinking that I'm part of America. And, uh, and then I, I spent the last three years in Washington uh, working with Code Pink and, uh, and I really got to see America. I think, it's, I think it is Jim McGovern who says, you know, the Democrats can chew gum and walk at the same time. Well, I think we who are part of the inside outside cadre can do that too. So um, I wholeheartedly agree that it is so important to put pressure on our Congress people. Now I'm, fortunate enough to have Jim McGovern as my congressperson. But, um, but it is those local constituents. And when I've gone to, to visit offices, I'll say to Catherine Clark, to her office, uh, I'm here representing, and I give the names of my people, who, my friends, who are her constituents, so that I'm not just this outsider, because nobody really gives an ass about the people if they're not your your constituents and oftentimes even if they are so uh but but to at least you know and and that has a weight um and at the same time i so wholeheartedly agree with you alex that you know it isn't nice to block the doorway it's nice to go to jail but that's the nice ways often fail and right now with the covid um taking these these more extreme actions um, is scary for lots of people. Um, you want to get COVID, get arrested and go to jail. Um, so so I think it, it really it's incumbent on us to be as creative as possible and um, and to, to remember that we can both do you know support our Congress people to challenge them and also to uh, to break the law sometimes because the laws are so unjust. And especially supporting our Black Lives Matter, our movement for Black Lives, sisters and brothers, family, because because uh, they're really in the vanguard. And uh, anyway, thanks for this 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 breakout well, thank room. You. Thank, right. you. Uh, thank you, and Jenna. I think Seth was next, and then Jenna. Oh. 
Oh. Okay. So you want me in, or yes, well, no? Unless Seth wants to go. Well, Jenna, go ahead, and then we'll get Seth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jenna then Seth. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when I think of inside outside strategy, I think inside is um, electoral politics, working within the party, trying to transform the party from within. And when I think outside, I think bringing the masses together who are more interested in actual um, uh, advocating for, for issues, uh, doing the protest movements and, and working together as coalitions, regardless of what your party registration is. Um, so I see it as those two things. What I, I, I am, um, I did oversleep this morning. <laughs> so I missed the first part of this call. I'm just a little confused why there's such an angry tone when this is really just a workshop of, of getting together and discussing the, the ideas, right? We're just coming together, discussing the ideas to move forward. So I'm not sure why everyone's mad and I feel like I missed something. Did I miss something? No, <laughs> no. no, it hasn't okay. been, it hasn't been can, that, like that. It, okay. It's, it's been okay. Alex has just been very uh, uh, adamant in his uh, what he's saying, and we agree with you, Alex. We agree with you. The, we've got to support the the outside movements, the social movements, and bring them in to the Democratic Party and fight for that poll. So, um, where did I go? Seth, did you have your hand up? Seth, um, no. Okay. Diane does. <laughs> Yes, Seth hit his hand up by mistake, and I can't raise my hand, but I'd like to be on the stack for a second. Okay, Diane, okay. then Mike Hirsch. Okay, go, Mike. Oh. No, we'll Diane. Go Diane. Diane's up. Oh, Diane. <laughs> then Mike Hirsch. This is a little different, uh, doing it this way. I guess I just um, want to say now I'm a little bit, like, uh, um, confused, but one of the things, I guess, when... Alex was talking and with other people's time. Um, I also feel like direct action and um, that's a really important piece. And actually I'm gonna be bringing that up in the afternoon breakouts. But um, I think that, you know, the whole idea and why we put on Russ contestants, you know, why Mass Peace Action reached out to all these groups to put on a joint conference was so that we can come together as some sort of coalition alliance or whatever and find, you know, things to do together in our similarities, similarities and, you know, still do our own thing, but also that, you know, they're doing the three prong federal, state and direct action. For me, I'm more of a direct action person. Um, and I do think that being, you know, having all those, I mean, what I'm learning is that we do need to do some from the inside. I wish we didn't, but we do. And I think, but I, I think that having a large enough progressive base that has come together, you know, and not is all over the place. Cause I see a lot of like infighting in the progressive movement or like, you know, just come together and say, okay, we're, you know, we have some common goals. Let's fight for those together so that we are a larger voice. So that people are going to listen to us and take us seriously and supporting people right now within the democratic party, like the squad and saying we are behind them and getting enough people behind them. And, you know, Ayanna Presley in Massachusetts and, you know, enough, and enough people behind them so that, their voices really can be heard and we can make them heard and we can go and do a sit. It is a little bit different with COVID, but we did a climate action where we did a Burma shave action. We stood six feet apart, we wore masks and we, you know, did an action. I think it is possible. So I guess I see it can work both ways, but I think we need to join together. If we don't, I think we're screwed. I think that it's shown enough we're screwed if we do it alone. Um, um, and I think we have, uh, that is great, Diane. Thank you. I, I think we have Mike Hurst and Dorothy Reich, um, and then people should add their hands in the, in the participants window if they want to speak, and we'll go through the stack, and we got about nine minutes left. I just want to do, toss this out, too. We are in a new era at the federal level, congressionally, that the public policy um, legislation that's drafted from Pramila's office and from the squad members is, uh, and it, you know, it gets a, a hearing publicly now. So there's really stuff to work with at the federal level that hasn't been there uh, until this new post Bernie Sanders campaign generation. Um, 
So that's what we're working off in our inside outside strategy around the specific federal liaison project. Dorothy, no, sorry, Mike first and Dorothy. Yeah, I'll try to be as quick as possible. Um, we had an exciting effort where we had people um, in our coalition gluing themselves to the doors in, in the congressional buildings and blocking up everything. And what we did in, in that instance was to um, highlight the, the, the climate issue because members of Congress are woefully uh, disengaged on climate, which, you know, as we all know, is an existential threat. And we paired that with a massive, uh, what we call letter drop. And this was in the pre-COVID era. And we're going to have to uh, adjust our strategy. But at, at that time, we delivered, um, hand-delivered um, specific letters backed by a large coalition of environmentalists and climate activists led by youth that we took to every single senator and every single member of the House in a, a couple of days. So what we did is we paired direct action right under their noses and right in their faces, which we have to do. Another time we did that was regarding the Dreamers, where we had Dreamers in Senate and uh, House offices sitting in, making a whole heck of a lot of noise. And basically they changed the rules because that was so successful. Um, because we were videoing that and then they said, you can't video what well, we did it anyway. And pairing that direct action again with what we call letter drops where we said, okay, you have people in your office screaming and yelling and they are righteous and they are correct on the issue and you've ignored them and we're not gonna let you ignore them. But we pair that with a solution, pass protections for the dreamers, um, overturn what Trump has done and for a minute, Chuck Schumer even shut down the government, although he lost his nerve and, and, and caved in. But these are instances where we can be successful. And I'll point out one thing where we were very successful. Um, back when um, Lieberman was still in the Senate, he and a bunch of um, war hawks basically passed a resolution or were trying to pass a resolution that would have amounted to an act of war against Iran. And we went in and we basically forced the Senate to pull back. They had the votes and they were going to pass something that would have amounted to an act of war against Iran. And we stopped them just by doing the inside stuff. So the inside stuff is very, very important. The outside stuff is also equally important, but one without the other cannot succeed. And that's why I think the inside outside approach is so important and so critical. Hey, thank you, Mike Kirsch. And, uh, uh, Dorothy Reich is up, uh, also from Southern California. Dorothy, take it away. Dorothy has to unmute. Dorothy, I'm Hi. Hi. Sorry, I missed the beginning of the meeting, but... Um, so, yeah, yesterday after our meeting, I was on another Zoom, and it was with... There's a group called End Homelessness Now. They're Freedom Socialist Party people. And they're trying to do work around the, uh, there's a place in, in California called El Sereno and the government owns a lot of the buildings there. They condemned them for a freeway which never got built. And they're working among other things on getting those, those uh, buildings occupied by homeless people. And they, they're, they have a, a great Facebook page and they do good graphics and they, they're writing, putting together a letter. And I said, hey, you know, Get this letter together. We'll turn it into a into um, a resolution. We'll take it to the to the local Democratic County Democratic Party. We'll get it passed, and then these city council people will pay a lot more attention to what you're trying to do. Of course, they're focused on homelessness already, but I'm working with them, and I'm trying to. And I said, maybe you want to think about becoming Democrats. And working with us inside the party and outside the party and trying to accomplish our goals. And they're like, we're freedom, Dem we're, you know, we're freedom socialists, and, you know, but little by little working with them as they see that I can get something accomplished, um, maybe they'll come into the fold. So that's working inside and outside the party. And that's what I try to do. I try to find groups that we can work with and bring them in and try to accomplish their goals together. Hey, thank you. And um, Martha, it will have the final say. And just a quick word from Dan and me just to wrap up the session. Martha, thank you, Dorothy. And Martha, take it away. Hello. Um, 
I'm from Wisconsin and you all know that Wisconsin has kind of been living under Tea Party hell for the last 10 years. And I've been involved, you know, since day one with the Madison uprising, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I've been saying for such a long time, and I'd love to hear what you guys are saying about this, is that we have to work as a coalition. And, you know, each, each you know, different groups tend to have like, um, their own silos. They like, you know, the you know they work in the environment, or they work for, um, you know, uh, people of color, um, or they work for homelessness, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They, you know, have their own silos, and I think that's fine and dandy. But when there's a call for action, you need to be able to call the whole, you know, all these different groups together and help each other out, uh, because if we don't coordinate with each other and we don't form coalitions, um, you know, we need the, we need people and we need a lots of numbers of people. And, you know, to me, I'm Jewish, okay? And so, you know, I always say the progressive movement is kind of like, you know, a, a room full of um, Jews. You have five people in a room and you have 2000 different types of um, arguments. Um, so I think that, when we call for, you know, if we do this and call for action with, you know, with the coordination, um, we need to put our, you know, our silos behind us and work together. And that's, you know, that's the only way I see it, you know, see it working. Um, one thing I have to say is that I have never forgiven um, Barack Obama for not showing up on the streets in Madison, like he said that he would do, uh, you know, he did say that he was going to work with the uh, unions and that he would, uh, you know, walk with the unions and he, and he didn't do that. So, but that's my problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Dan, if you just want to wrap, I mean, you know, um, I, you like, I appreciate everybody, um, you know, Sunrise followed me on that general meeting and you know, they got right out, out of the bat and somehow, uh, you know, they just, they did what all the, uh, any other organization would do, which was almost nonstop sunrise promotion. So if people are interested in PDA, I'll do my due diligence and, and I encourage everybody to sign up for our liaison program. And, uh, you know, and uh, also, you know, if you do live in a, a district that's majority people of color and you're not a person of color, uh, you know, if there's a space open, be a placeholder in the liaison program until we, uh, you know, uh, we're just building the program. We have a lot of the seats already filled, but there are seats open. And it, really every district, we can always use a backup team. So please sign up to the liaison program. And if you can drop that in again, Dan, that'd be great. And I suppose, what do we do now? We're supposed to go back to the general session. <laughs> is that what we're, we're supposed to do for the conference? Because obviously this yeah. Zoom yeah. is not connected through a breakout. No, we, we yeah. go back to the, the page we used yesterday, I wanna, uh, the Zoom link yesterday. I want to thank everybody for joining our breakout. Thank you, Alan Minsky. Thank you, everybody, for participating. And if you want to sign up for the liaison pro program, it's in the chat right now. You can grab it and uh, and sign up. There we go. Okay. The recording. The recording. Who? Uh, where will this recording be? I'm. They're putting it together. It's gonna. It, I think it'll go out to all the participants. But we're putting it all together. So everyone, it has to upload somewhere. Don't ask me. But it does. Yeah. I know yeah. that. Yeah. I'm gonna upload this recording. Thank you, Alex, for your passion. Thank you, Dan O'Neill, for facilitating. Thank you, Alan Minsky, and thank you so much, everybody, for participating. Thank you. Uh, Thank anybody you. wants more information about the, the liaison program, you can always email me at russell at pdamerica.org. That's russell at pdamerica.org. Right. Thank you, everybody. See you back in the main room. See you back you. in the main room. Bye. Okay.